Hey guys, CS Joseph with csjoseph.life. Uh, this is like the first time that I've had to refilm a video. I think I've actually done it one other time, but I did this already and it ended up being 40 minutes long. And uh, for some reason, the audio in the video got all out of whack and it was, it was a crap shoot. So I decided to redo it. Maybe I'll go through it faster this time. I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. But anyway, so this particular lecture is about cognitive transitions. I've gotten a ton of questions, especially in the last couple of days. It wasn't really user requested, but given that the audience has been asking questions about this, I just figured, okay, fine. We're between a series right now. I'm just gonna get this out there to answer a bunch of questions so I don't have to keep answering the same question over and over, et cetera, right? So, but yeah, um, awesome. Kind of transition. So what, what does that mean? Like, how is that like relevant? Well, cognitive transitions are when you have the four sides of the mind, ego, subconscious, unconscious, superego, they're together in a human being, right? And those four sides of the mind uh, work together in unity, et cetera. We talked about uh, a couple of days ago with Mr. Radiohead about how the cognitive functions are like a radio tuning into different spectra and uh, are able to gather and send and receive information, right? Well, today we're gonna to be talking about how you can easily shift voluntarily or involuntary out of your ego into your subconscious or your unconscious or your superego and decisions and things that you can do to help speed along the process or to give you mastery over some of the size of your mind is just kind of how it works, right? So we'll just look at the mechanics of the four sides of the mind and how they're able to go in and out in that way with a little bit of a deeper dive. So with that in mind, we have here the ESTP. We're just using this, uh, this person uh, on paper here as an example. They have their ego, they have their INFJ subconscious, their ISTJ unconscious, and their ENFP superego. So how does an ESTP get into their subconscious. Well, their subconscious the INFJ, it is known as the sage of the mountain, right? Uh, and then the ESTP is the persuader. So it really goes down to gateways. The gateway functions are the fourth function, which is the inferior slash aspirational function, and the fifth function, which is the nemesis function, and then the final function, which is the eighth function, which is the demon function. These are the gateways. Now you could say that the top function, the hero, is also a gateway. It is the gateway into the ego, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So those are the gateway functions. First, fourth, fifth, eighth. Those functions are the gateway functions, and the gateway functions is what you need to go to. You need to learn to master them, or people could put you in them involuntarily in an insecure or worried in some situation, or something that's like outside of your will, like you were put there unwillfully, and you can get thrown into those sides of your mind quickly through those gateways, right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, if you watched anime and you saw this series called Naruto and then there's this, this uh, dude named Guy and he's like one of the teachers and he like opens gates to gain access to more abilities uh, with his fighting style or whatever. Same kind of thing uh, from a psychological standpoint. You have to treat these functions like gateways. They're all about giving you access to other parts of your mind, right? A lot of people talk about how we only use a certain percentage of our minds and we, it would be great if we could access other areas of our mind. Well, these are the four known gateways right now. Maybe potentially there's other psychological gateways that we're not even aware of yet and then hopefully we'll be able to unlock and then as a result of that, uh, reach new abilities somehow. You know, yeah, okay, I'm talking about like heroes, you know, that awesome show. And I do kind of look like Zachary Quinto, right? But don't worry, I don't eat brains or, you know, touch brains, I guess, if you saw the show. Anyway, uh, so yeah, the ESTP. So what, what does that mean? So let, let's look at, let's look at the path of, to integration. And what is integration? Integration is basically enlightenment, basically. The, the true definition of enlightenment is not being some rando Buddhist person and meditating all the time. Enlightenment actually is a psychological state. And that psychological state is when all four sides of your mind are actually working together in harmony and completely integrated. And it's through that integration 
that you are able to reach your most ascended highest available self. But we'll talk about why that's like really hard to do, especially with the presence of, you know, the demon. So that, that, that's an issue. So anyway, four sides of the mind are the ego, subconscious, unconscious, and superego. So let's say the persuader, the ESTP, is in the ego. And if you notice that it is extroverted, and you notice the superego is extroverted, but the subconscious and the unconscious are introverted. Well, that has to do with introversion, extroversion, and how uh, energy, mental energy flows between the cognitive functions and between the four sides of the mind. So for example, if you're a persuader, and let's say you've been around a lot of people. So let's look at the definition of extroversion. It's right over here. Extroversion, three's a crowd. That means three or more people equals an extroverted situation. Two people or one-on-one, -on -one, also known as face-to-face, -face, or when someone is alone in solitude, that is introversion. So if someone's an introvert, meaning their ego is an introvert, and they are in a one-on-one -on -one scenario or they are by themselves, that is an introverted situation. They're able to gain energy, gain mental energy, recharge their mental uh, batteries as a result of that situation not for extroverts. If extroverts are in one-on-one -on -one scenarios or if they are, uh, or if they're by themselves, they start to lose mental energy and they have to go recharge. So they have to put themselves in what we call threes a crowd situations. And when they're in those threes a crowd situations, they are basically extroverting and they are gaining mental energy, right? So mental energy flow. So we have an ESTP, he's been threes of crowding, and then he's got all that energy, he's got, uh, uh, his batteries are full, and he sees somebody come along who is like, uh, let's say they're lacking in manhood, or they need a reality check, or they're like this omega-based person. I say that because persuaders are very uh, wolf pack oriented, they, they are like the alpha male, basically, or the alpha female, the alpha amongst their group of people or their peers. They always aspire to be the alpha, and uh, then they wanna make people around them into betas, into strong, capable betas, or potentially fellow alphas here and there. And so they like to train those people and improve those people. Why? Well, because the INFJ sage subconscious, just like INFJs, INFJ's primary purpose in the world is to improve other people and make people better, right? So through making people better, they are literally turning omegas that the persuader finds and turning them into betas or potentially fellow alphas down the road. That's what persuaders do. That's what ESTPs do, right? So, uh, like, go, like imagine, like imagine a schoolyard, right? And uh, there's like, there's a, the bully is the ESTP, and he sees someone who's like really weak. It's probably like a, an INTP or whatever, and that ESTP flips them a lot of crap all the time, right? It's because the ESTP can't stand how weak that person is, and they're trying to make that person stronger, but the problem is is that, I'm sorry, SI child's not really gonna do anything. There's some major incompatibility there. SI child's stuck in its ways and like trying to be super comfortable, even with an INFP situation, and the ESTP's just gotta come to the terms that that's not really gonna happen, but the ESTP continues to judge that person as an, as an omega, right? So trying to improve that person with their INFJ side. Well. The ESTP is going to move on eventually and realize that that's not going to work out until they finally find somebody. And then it's like, okay, I have all this extra mental energy from extroverting and I found this person that I could finally teach and take under my wing and they could become my apprentice for a while or whatever. And they become the INFJ subconscious. And it, take, and it allows them, what it allows them to do, it allows them to focus, to focus all of the energy because they're unfocused with their SE, with their SE hero, right? So when they go in their INFJ subconscious, they're NI inferior is activating and it becomes like an NI hero and they're able to focus their energy on that one person and improve them with their FE, the new FE, and then use logic to prove why it's important and then give them the experience that they would never forget with their extroverted sensing so that the persuader can improve this human being and cause them to become more developed, become a beta or become a, a, a potential alpha one day, but get them out of omega status basically. That's what the ESTP does. So. The ESTP has improved this person with the INFJ, and from there, the INFJ, uh, you know, it spends, because it's, because it's introverted, uh, and the persuader is extroverted, it's spending a lot of mental energy. And then the ESTP gets tired from, you know, bringing this person up and teaching this person and helping them become an alpha, etc. This phenomenon right here is exactly why I actually know type, why I know this form of psychology. Because when I was living on the street, 
I met a man uh, by the name of Robert D. Bryant. Robert D. Bryant uh, uh, was, was a coworker of mine and he mentored me in type because he saw that I was basically an Omega and he was trying to get me up to at least beta status and potentially an alpha down the road. He saw that in me and he spent a lot of time with me, educating me, teaching me, and through him, I actually got to meet my other mentor in psychology, R.P. Morel, which I am very thankful for. And that was a fantastic experience. Both those gentlemen helped build up my manhood in me because they're using one of the four, uh, the four archetypes of the mature masculine known as the magician, right? Uh, if you need to find out more about that, read King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, or refer to my uh, How Do Intimate Relationships Actually Work playlist, etc. So yeah, uh, ESTP, Robert D. Bryant, used his INFJ subconscious to basically mentor me and improve me, etc. So that's basically how that worked. The problem is it cost Mr. Bryant a lot of energy because he was basically introverting being in that one-on-one -on -one scenario, so it cost him energy, and then eventually he had to go back right into his ego and had to go extrovert. And then he would just straight up leave, or he'd take all of us, and we'd go see a movie with a bunch of people. Actually, I got to see The Avengers, the very first Avengers film, in theaters with him because it was one of those times where he's so focused on teaching me that he just couldn't handle it anymore. He's like, okay, we gotta get in the car and go. We gotta get out of here. And then we ended up in the Avengers film and I got to see Avengers. It was dope. And we had a bunch of people there and uh, we, we were able to extrovert, gain energy again, and then go back to learning again. That's how it worked. Now, there is some issues though. When an ESTP is doing that with their INFJ, they're actually aspiring. They're not using their uh, NI inferior. It actually becomes an NI aspirational. Now, what's the difference? See, you can go into your INFJ subconscious as an ESTP, or you can go into your subconscious, depending on which type you are, it doesn't matter. If you're fourth, it depends on how you're approaching it. If you're approaching it from insecurity, the experience will be very negative. So for example, imagine an ESTP who's being insecure about what they want because they don't know what they want. They really have no idea. They're so afraid of wanting the wrong thing, right? So imagine they see that Omega come by, that Omega just triggers them with how, with how weak that person is and they can't stand it, but they're really insecure. They don't know what they want to do. They don't know how, they don't know how, know how they would want to approach this person, right? So they just default to extroverted sensing and give that person experience. And if that person is not an SI user and a fellow extroverted sensing user, it turns into a bar fight, right? It turns into a brawl. Fists and go up because the introverted sensing user is not really gonna you know, they're gonna be like, okay, okay, maybe I see your point. You know, they'd be willing to uh, let the ESTP have room to want to help them in that regard. But a fellow SE user, probably not really. And it's gonna end up landing, they're gonna end up landing blows and exchanging blows with each other, right? It's gonna turn into a fist fight. Why? Because the ESTP was not sure what it wants and they were insecure. And when that happens, when, when an ESTP is an insecure and they go in their subconscious, that INFJ, just like regular INFJs, have the potential of alienating people if they're FI critic, guess what? That ESTP is using the INFJ subconscious and through their insecurity in this gateway, if there's insecurity in this gateway, they will start to alienate other people that they are trying to improve. It happens all the time. It ha actually happened to uh, an ESTP uh, who was the older brother of an ISGJ friend that I had growing up and he would beat his younger brother all the time because he's like, he's too weak. And I have to beat him to make him stronger. Okay, that is ridiculous and it's stupid. ESTPs, if you're watching this, stop doing that. That's not actually how people work. Like seriously, come on. That just means you're physically abusive. Wake up. That's not really real, you know. People don't improve like that. You know how people improve? Well. INFJ stage of the mountain basically means that you have wisdom. So guess what, ESTPs, if you wanna be improving anyone, if you wanna be making anyone not being weak, you need to stop being weak yourself. How do you do that? Well, get over your insecurity. But I don't know what I want. That's stupid, like seriously. Just pay attention to what other people are doing and then you know what you want. But then you get stuck in analysis paralysis where you're just like, ooh, I'm gonna keep observing people over and over and over again. Then I have failure to launch syndrome because I'm not paying attention to what I want. I'm just so focused on what everyone else is doing, right? Oh yeah, that's useful. Great, way to be stuck in your mother's basement forever because you can't make a decision. Or way to wake up at 40 years old and have your entire life gone by you having slept with over 600 people, right? And then it's like, oh, maybe I should actually like settle down with somebody, but I can't decide what I want. I'm this crazy nymphomaniac, right?
Come on, like, learn some chastity, be chaste, and be devoted to one person. Just pick one. It's not that hard, okay? Figure out what you want, because guess what? If you allow yourself ESTPs, if you allow yourself to fail, if you actually seek failure, you know, make decisions, fail. Failure is good. It'll teach your SI something about failure, because then you won't fail again, because you failed too many times already. But guess what? The number one important thing about INFJs are, and that is, gentlemen and ladies, wisdom. Wisdom is the key, but how does the ESTP gain wisdom? Well, they get over their insecurity and they allow themselves to fail because wisdom comes from failure. Wisdom comes from suffering. You cannot gain wisdom without failure. You cannot gain wisdom without suffering. You cannot be comforted into wisdom. And the whole point behind INFJ subconscious is conferring wisdom upon others. And the only way you're going to get wisdom is through failure. So ESTPs allow yourself to fail, right? Don't be afraid. It's because of your fear that you end up alienating other people and pushing people away, especially when you do your reality checks and your loyalty checks. It's wrong and it's abusive. And it's all because you people are too insecure. Stop being insecure. All you have to do is figure out what you want. If you don't know what you want, you can find out by failing over and over again and being okay with failure. I seek failure all the time because I learn something and then I learn rapidly and it gains me wisdom. And then I'm able to confer it upon fellow men. You know, what you're supposed to be doing, ESTPs? But then now I have to do it. Wake up. Anyway, so wisdom. Inferior function has insecurity. Everyone has an inferior function. It all starts out insecure. And as we mature, it becomes more developed and you're able to aspire with it. So when the inferior function starts aspiring, that is fantastic. And then because you have aspired ESTPs, you're able to gain wisdom and confer that upon other people with your subconscious. So what does that mean? Okay, so if you're watching this or listening to this on the podcast, what that means is, is that in order for you to gain access to your subconscious, you have to go through your fourth function. And you're going to go into your subconscious in two ways. The first way is with insecurity, or the second way is with aspiration. If you go in with fear, you're going to have really bad results and it's gonna turn into a crapshoot. If you're going in aspiring to be something more, to become a better version of you, even if it's the polar opposite of you, you're going to have great results and it's gonna make you the most happiest person. And it is what you have to do to become integrated. So the answer to the question is, how do I master my subconscious? The answer is, get over your fear. Do not be afraid. Fear not. Fear is the mind killer. I'm literally quoting Frank Herbert right now. Fear is the mind killer. If you want to stop yourself from being afraid, you have to get control of your mind. Read. Read books. And if you, oh, but I'm too lazy to read books. Dude, there's no excuse. Just read books. It's not that hard. Well, I don't have time to like sit down and read a book. Okay, fine. Get some headphones, get some audiobooks, and when you're commuting to your job, listen to the audiobooks. So then if you're commuting a half hour each way, that means one hour of reading a day. Oh, yeah, there's no excuse. You should be reading. Reading helps get rid of the fear. It makes you more capable, which eliminates fear, which gives you mastery over your subconscious. Ergo, read, and then you will master your subconscious. It's not that hard, people. Come on. So let's talk about the unconscious. The unconscious side of the mind, the gateway for it is SI, or for the ESTP it's SI, but is the nemesis function. The nemesis function is where a person's worry exists, right? So worry is a problem. So if you're, if you're, if you're worried, you're gonna go into your unconscious and that's actually going to create immaturity. So the unconscious naturally is very immature. It's just an immature version of your ego. So a lot of a person's immaturity actually comes from an underdeveloped unconscious. And it will stay underdeveloped if you are worried about things. I worry about my future, the ESTP worries about the past, I'll never be able to repeat the experiences of my amazing childhood, I feel very nostalgic and I'm getting really depressed about it, I wish I could give that same experience to my son, but apparently I don't, I'm not making enough money because I'm not able to do that because everyone wants to inflate my money because people like printing money and it's not my fault, my system is just a bunch of crap. Okay, yeah, fine. But still, wake up, it's not about that. You have to get over your worry. Okay, so as part of self-development, getting over your worry 
keeps the unconscious from being immature and then you are able to start maturing with it. Okay, so how does this actually work for an ESTP? Well, it'll get, like for example, the ISTJ is the Walking Library of Alexandria. It has the ability to be super organized, right? So being organized is amazing. So with it being so organized, the ESTP actually will be able to schedule things and will be able to uh, be very organized and very uh, process oriented and actually have a procedure that they hold themselves to. And they gain access to self-discipline because self-discipline comes from introverted sensing. Ooh, and then if I have a, a more mature unconscious, that means I'm going to be more self-disciplined, which means I'll be less impulsive and I inferior. And maybe I'll actually be able to be devoted to one woman or one man in my relationships. Come on, that's how it works. Get over your worry. The reason why ESTPs are so nymphomania oriented is because they're so worried with their SI that they're not gaining the experience that they want all the time, so they keep going, or the, and they don't know what they want because these two team up, and it's like, wow, I just have a huge fear-based worry complex, and then I just end up having illicit relationships and I'm this serial monogamist over and over and over and over again until I'm 40 and I wake up and I have a midlife crisis and then I get super depressed and then I start offing myself. Wow, that's really productive, ESTPs. You know what I mean? But that's what happens. That's what happens with people because they get stuck in their inferior and they get stuck in their nemesis and trying to develop themselves, but they can't because they can't get over the fear and they can't get over the worry. And that's like, come on, stop being so worried. By the way, and how I said seeking failure helps get over your fear, it also helps you get over your worry too and helps you mature, right? Failure is the best teacher, wisdom. And wisdom is what solves the problem. So by gaining wisdom because you're open to failure, you will end up being able to develop your, subcon your unconscious, not and your subconscious, but your unconscious in such a way where you will be able to access the ISTJ and use it for more capable components. Instead of being all depressed all the time, instead of just assuming everyone else around you is stupid, instead, instead of you behaving immorally, right? And then being devoted to destroying other people's futures and just be, and having an insanely closed mind. That's what happens to ESTPs worry. They have an insanely closed mind. Look at it this way. I'm an ENTP, right? I was stuck in my shadow for a lot of years because my family didn't really like my ego, right? And then when I got away from my family and it was around 26 years of age, that I was finally able to get back into my ego after my mind healed for so long. And they're like, okay, thank God, I'm an ENTP now, now I know what to do. And it took a long time for me to get over my insecurity and get over my worry, but now I'm more organized. I have procedures, I have processes, I have scheduling, I'm able to do presentations on a whiteboard. People like Eric and Opaloid are making YouTube videos about me saying how I'm an ENTJ when that's not even remotely true, but I kind of look like it. Why? Well, because I have a developed INTJ shadow because I've gotten over my worry and I'm able to use the INTJ strategic approach to what I do with this science for you folks on this YouTube channel. It just makes it look like I'm an ENTJ when in reality I'm not. That's the point. So again, how do you deal with the unconscious? Well, how do you deal with the subconscious? Get over your fear. And then for this one, get over your worry and then you can utilize all the positive traits of both these types in addition to your ego and you'll be capable. And remember, if you spend time a lot in the unconscious, you're gonna lose mental energy and you're gonna to have to go back in your ego, for example. So that's how it works. Super ego is a little bit different. The super ego is very different. In the same way that the ego is insanely powerful, it is the apex of a person's conscious mind. The, uh, the, the, the super ego is the apex of the bottom side of the human soul. It is the source of sin nature, according to various uh, religious circles. Uh, it's what I call the human condition, the source of the human condition, the source of human corruption is the demon. The demon is insanely powerful. It can grant any wish. It's like a genie in the bottle that you pull out at the last minute. It is insanely powerful. The problem is, is that when you go to the demon, you make a Faustian deal with it to gain access to his power. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna grant your wish, but you know, I'm gonna give you an inch, but I'm gonna take a mile. And that's how it works. And then all of a sudden, you, you make a deal with the, with the demon. Okay, please save the world from these people. And the demon's like, oh, great, I'm going to go save the world from those people. And then you come back and the entire world is just desert wasteland. And the demon's like, yeah, but the, the people are gone. So don't worry, right? We're good. Okay, yeah, but the world is destroyed. It's a Faustian deal. You don't make those deals, right? So how do you deal with that? The superego is trying to replace the ego. They are locked in this forever combat. That's a problem. Why is that? Well, Martin Luther, 
you know, the father of Protestantism basically said that the self is trying to bend in upon the self. That is what he maintains as sin nature or the human condition, right? And that is what the ego, the superego is trying to do to the ego. It's trying to grab at it and replace it. So it can become the ego, right? So the demon exists here in this little cage and it's a uh, eighth slot and it's, in a, and it's in a cage. And you know what? Let's be honest. If you don't feed the demon, it will come out. I'm an ENTP. I have SE demon. I exist to destroy people's moments. That's why I am super spiteful. That's why I'm a harsh asshole, basically, on YouTube telling you guys about type and how, especially the INFJ and the INFP videos, all the people are complaining about me being so harsh and so critical. And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, it's the truth. I'm not here to comfort you guys, you know, into wisdom. Like, you can't get wisdom without with, with comfort. So I'm here to breathe fire on y'all to wake you up so you realize what's really happening so you guys can change and have a better tomorrow. Because, like, that's maturity. I'm sorry, but, you know, uh, rites of passage for maturity, like, used to be a thing, but apparently we don't. So now I have to be here breathing the fire of truth to wake y'all up so you actually have this thing called maturity so we can have a better world tomorrow instead of the shit show that it is now for our children. Yeah. No, thank you. Anyway. So the super ego. So you have the demon. Yeah, so you can make that Faustian deal with the demon and you can become super powerful. And my demon makes me really spiteful. Well, me being spiteful is an example of me throwing some meat to the demon in the cage. Because if you try to put bars around the demon, the demon's going to ultimately break out of the cage and come out and just way late, way waste to everything, devastate everything, because that's what it does. For example, Catholic Church and various other religious communities are telling people that they shouldn't have sex until marriage. And guess what people are going to do? They're going to have sex before marriage. Because when you tell people what they can't do, they're going to do it. When you tell the demon what it can't do, it's going to do it. It's going to eventually become strong because it becomes so hungry and it will come out of its cage and it will literally destroy everything. And that's not what you do. When it comes to your demon, you get a few steaks and you throw it a few scraps, right? Throw throw the demon some scraps, make it a little happy, you know, placate a little bit, and then it's like in, in the cage. Oh, but you can't do that to your sin nature, that's horrible, you know? And I'm like, okay, yeah, you're probably that person that's trying to teach abstinence to people too. Not that abstinence isn't wrong, but at the same time, like, this whole, like, we're going to teach you abstinence while not teaching you responsible sexual behavior with condoms and whatnot, which also backfires, you know what I mean? Why? Well, it's because the demon is coming out of its cage. Let's be honest, that's what happens. Because human beings will always do the opposite of what you tell them to do. Because of the demon. Because the demon will come free. You can't just, you can't just put this wild animal and put it in bars and expect that, okay, that's it. You know, we're just gonna shove it under the rug and it's never gonna happen. Japanese culture, they kind of have it right. From their point of view, everyone could be totally a, a total kinky nymphomaniac anytime they want. That's perfectly normal. They can do that anytime they want. As long as within the right time, the right place, the right look, you know, the the right scenery, the right place in town, you know what I mean? And no one judges anyone for that because they recognize that everyone has those urges, etc. And they've compartmentalized that part of society in this location and no one is judged for it. Whereas in first world culture like the United States or at least Western culture, it is looked down upon, which creates this huge uh, rep repressed demons in the cage. And then when the cage flies open finally because the demon just gotten so strong and so fed up with being ignored and neglected that it literally destroys that person's life. And then you start having alcoholism and addiction and drugs and illicit sex and uh, uh, getting pregnant before their time, uh, awakening love before their time, rape, pedophilia, you name it. This is where it comes from, guys. It's because the demon is locked in the cage and it's not fed every now and then. You have to be careful. Now, that's not to say that the superego can actually be used for good. It can be. For example, sometimes if you're dealing with a problem in your life, and you have your ego and it's trying to solve a problem and it fails. So it goes to your, your unconscious trying to solve a problem and it fails. You use your subconscious, try to solve a problem and it fails. What's left? Well, the superego. Sometimes you just have to be willing to let everything burn. Sometimes you have to get to a point where you have nothing to lose. And that is how you can utilize the demon properly. It's when you finally humble yourself and realize that there's absolutely nothing you can do and you have hit rock bottom and the demon exists for you to self-destruct your life so that new life can begin. Burning down the entire forest 
setting everything fresh and anew so that new life can grow. That is the real purpose of the superego. It exists to literally reformat, rebuild, destroy and rebuild your life so that you can have a better life, a better tomorrow. That's what it exists. It's like the ultimate self-destruct button so you can just blow up your life and start anew. Now that doesn't mean you go commit suicide anew, I'm in a new life. No, that's, that's no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, like for example, let's say you're in a rough marriage and you're getting really disrespected or you're, or you're being not loved uh, by your husband or you're being disrespected by this woman and uh, it's just time. It's just time to end that relationship. But you're not willing to end that relationship because you're afraid, you know, inferior function and you're worried about what might happen. Nemesis function? No, no, no. You got to get over your fear. You got to get over your worry. And you got to be willing to set it all on fire. Here's a good way of putting it. An INFJ known as Jesus Christ actually once said this. He who is willing to save his life will lose it. He who is willing to lose his life will gain it. What does that mean? Well, it's wisdom. And that wisdom basically is this. Use the superego. You have to be willing to set your entire life on fire. You have to be willing to go through the divorce. You have to be willing to put everything on the line. Put everything on red and you're playing roulette, for example. You have to be willing to go all the way because you realize that you have nothing to lose and you have everything to gain. That's the point of the superego. That is when the superego should be used. That is when you make that Faustian deal with the devil because you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's the only time it's okay to be using the superego because the superego will reset your life and then you're back on track on a completely new path to happier times. That is what exists because in that, serious, in that situation, your ego has failed, your subconscious has failed, your, your unconscious has failed, and guess what? The superego is super powerful. It is... It is the nuclear option, and if you have nothing to lose and everything in the game, press the red button, reset your life, and move on. Become who you were meant to be. Stop being afraid. Stop being worried. Get control of your life. Get the losers out of your life, and become somebody new. Become somebody better, and become somebody who is wise. And if you're stuck in these fear and worries, well, you're not going to get anywhere which basically means, you know, you're on the path to being a loser. You're waking up at 40 and you have like your entire life has just been a total waste. Congratulations. When you should have gone to the superego a long time ago. That's what it means. So that is how the transitions work, cognitive transitions. That's how the path of integration. The idea is to get all four of these sides of your mind working in harmony together. To do that, get over your fear, get over your worry, and recognize when it's time to hit rock bottom that you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. That is what it is. Because especially if you decide to light your life on fire, especially when there's a divorce of children present, think about it this way from a divorce standpoint. It is better for you to get divorced now so that your children will respect you later when they come of age because you getting divorced was respectable, which would teach them to have self-respect when they come of age because you had self-respect now and decided to go through with the divorce. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Oh, maybe the superego actually does have a point. Maybe I should light my life on fire because I have everything to gain and nothing to lose. You have to be wise, guys. Stop being afraid, stop being worried, recognize when you've reached the rock bottom. If you do these things, you will have integration and you will be on the path to enlightenment. That is how this works. So, if you found this lecture to be useful, educational, insightful, please subscribe to the channel and leave a like. That would be awesome. And also subscribe on the podcast while you're at it. Uh, if you have any questions about the transitions, leave it in the comments section and I'll answer your questions. I go out of my way like at least twice a day to read all of the comments that my phone tells me I have. So then I like reply to them or like them or love them, etc. But yes, I am paying attention to the comments and I am getting some emails from you folks and I am responding to those emails. If I haven't responded to it, I apologize, but I'm getting there. Uh, just there's a lot to do and so very little time to do it, etc. So we are getting there. And also, uh, if you would like to have a grid that shows you how to type yourself and others, it's available on the front page of my website, which is 
csjoseph.life. Uh, you can go there, download that, just put in your email. If you put in your email, don't be afraid that I'm gonna spam you with some crazy newsletter. I'm gonna be doing private lectures specifically for the email group. And every time I send out an email, there should be some private content in there available. I'm not here to waste your time, if you know what I mean. So anyway, <sighs> all right, well, I have like three more of these to film today, so I'll see you guys tonight.